Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and we have a great guest tonight. But before we go to him, I want to mention that today is the feast of one of my Jesuit brothers, St. Andrew Bobula. Uh, St. Andrew Bobula was a, a Jesuit born in Poland and about in 1591. And he entered the society in Vilnius, which was part of the Polish Commonwealth in those days. And he became a missionary in the eastern part of the Commonwealth of Poland. Uh, and, you know, where there were a lot of people who were filled with superstition. They had not been taught the faith in a long time. So they were Catholic by heritage, but they, you know, just didn't know anything. And when people don't know the faith, they easily slip into superstitions. And so he went there and taught them a faith, freedom from a lot of that superstitious stuff. But in 1657, when he was already 66 years old, he ran into trouble with the Cossacks. And Cossacks captured him, and they dragged him for a few miles, and then they took him to a market, put him on one of the meat, uh, they know where they, where they, uh, the butcher's tables, and they were uh, beating him and scourging him. They carved a chasuble into his back in front with a knife. He kept on praying so they cut off his ears and nose, stuffed it in his mouth, kept praying so they cut his tongue out. He, he went through all this torture. And the reason I mention it is that when he was canonized in 1938 by Pope Pius XI, he was de declared the most tortured saint in the history of the church. Now, there's a lot of badly tortured people. Uh, today, he is recognized as one of the patron saints of Poland. So he's a great, great saint. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, you ought, ought to look him up in <clears throat> his role in defeating the Russian army, the Soviet Union's army invading Poland in 1920-21. All right, today we have a guest. He is a priest of the Archdiocese of Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada. And if you haven't been there, you ought to go. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. He, our guest is the pastor of St. Pius X Parish, and he's here to share with us about the surprising role of angels in our lives and how they offer us the enlightenment and encouragement of God. So please welcome the author of a brand new book, His Angels at Our Side, Understanding Their Power in Our Souls and the World. He's also the host of EWTN series, Angels of God. Please welcome Father John Horgan. Father John, welcome back. Thank you. We it's great to be back at EWTN. We don't see you today down here in the sunny south. You stay over no. there in the very pleasant weather, but a little more overcast. It was lovely uh, to come to summer here in Birmingham. Yes, these it days. is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, so it's great to have you here. And, uh, and I you. do hope people go to visit your beautiful city. It's wonderful. And why did you write a book about the angels? And you did a TV series. Yes. Now what are you up to? I wanted to write this book in order to introduce people to a friendship with these first created of God, who are magnificent creatures that help us to approach God's beauty and truth and magnificence and to watch over us day and night at God's command. When you say they're the first of creatures, what do you mean by that? I well, thought that in the beginning there was light. Ah, in the beginnings is the heavens and the earth, and the yeah. church is always attributed to the creation of light the presence of the angels also. Uh -huh. So they are the first created, the first reflections in creation of the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. And that the mystery of the Holy Trinity is both so remarkable and so overwhelming for us that we need every help that God gives us in order to contemplate him in his magnificence. And the angels can do that. Well, one of the things you do in this book is you go through uh, different 
information about the angels, how Scripture yes. speaks about these nine choirs of angels, and you talk about them and how the fathers of the church, you know, explain more of what that is in Scripture, because the, the nine choirs of angels are not in any one place, but throughout the Scripture you see exactly. them mentioned. Exactly. But in addition, this was the part, especially since I've been uh, doing this uh, series on Tuesdays on Scripture and tradition, mm -hmm. you have a section, of, uh, a big section about the angels in the Bible and their role in the history of salvation in Scripture. Yes. Uh, and the life of Christ. Start off with some of that. Why, why did God need to have angels when he's becoming man and all that? Well, the angels are an expression of God's generous love and his power and magnificence in creation. They are described in the Old Testament as uh, hosts of angels, which means that they are warriors. Hosts mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. is a term that, oath, yeah. yes, that, that refers to armies. Right. But they are also uh, the adorers of God. We find mm -hmm. them in adoration and in prayer. And that precedes all of their tasks as being messengers from God, mm -hmm. expressing his will to us. There are over 230 mentions of the angels in Scripture. In both Testaments? Yeah, in the, yes. Combined? The, combined. Okay. And we have, all, we have the names of three of the choirs in the Old Testament, and the other six come from the New Testament. So in the Old Testament we have? Seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. Okay. Angels in general are mentioned, yes, of course, but uh, these that's three another one of the uh, as a, that's a distinct choir. But uh, these three are seen as the court of God. They manifest His love, His wisdom, and His stability, His power. So, as you begin to study the the role of the angels in Scripture, their names and their place in the tradition of the church, you realize that uh, the angels are trinitarian in the extreme. They point us to the mystery of God, the Holy Trinity. They adore and contemplate the face of God always. And so they can be instruments of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. They teach us how to keep the face of God ever before us, which means not to turn away towards sin, towards evil, but to always be in contemplation of the good. In, in fact, one of the things I, uh, uh, certainly I think of Isaiah 6, mm -hmm. where the seraphim are mentioned, and saraf means to be flaming. Yes. You know, it be, to be uh, uh, on fire. So these are angels of, uh, characterized by flame. Yes. And these angels are crying out, kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. And it's three times mm -hmm. holiness. Mm -hmm. Again, like you say, Trinitarian. Hinting at the Trinity. Hinting at the Trinity. And of course, those words, that praise of the angels, has then been adopted by the Christian church. And, and, and by Judaism. And also by Judaism. In, in Israel. Yes. In Israel, they can say that mm -hmm. if there are ten men, mm -hmm. they can say the holy, 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 at the Viminion, mm -hmm. uh, Lord God of hosts. And we use it in the well, Mass, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the Trisagion as prayer is used in the, uh, especially in the Eastern churches and Orthodox churches. Right. We, and we've uh, now incorporated it into devotion in the West, especially because of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Yeah, we, but, we chant the uh, Trisagion, which means three times holy, mm -hmm. in uh, Aramaic at, at our parish, you know, beautiful. the Maronite parish. Beautiful. Kadishat Aloho, you know, Kadishat Hayel Tono. Uh, Kaddishat Lomoyuto, you know, that it's the same word, Kaddish, yes. or Kaddish, that's, that's used in the scripture. Yes, and in, in this way, for, for Latin Rite Catholics, of course, it's the introduction to the canon or the Eucharistic prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's very consciously been used as a, a way by which the church at prayer joins with the angels in the yes. praise of God in heaven. So, as the Catechism reminds us, the angels are with us, and they join their prayers to ours. Well, if we join our prayers more consciously to theirs, then our prayer becomes ever stronger and deepens our faith and our desire for the things that are above. In another way I've looked at it, too, is that in the Scripture, we see the angels 
teaching us to pray. Yes. Not only the holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. That's from the angels. Glory to God in the highest mm -hmm. and peace to his people on earth. That's from the angels. Yes. Uh, and then in the book of Revelation, the angels are singing a number of hymns that we use in uh, our hymnology as well. Certainly. And they're taking us to a different level of praise of God. Especially when we look to the prayers in the, in the book of Revelation, you see that their praise is of the fulfillment of God's wisdom and his plan and the magnificence of his love and his ordering of all things in truth to their final end. Mm -hmm. So the angels have that ability to focus our minds and our hearts on what really matters. Mm -hmm. And in a world filled with such distractions as our own today, this is all the more necessary for us to take every means and, and manner of means in order to look to the magnificence and the beauty of God. You know, there's a few people in tonight's audience who may have had the Baltimore Catechism. Any of you remember that? And you remember the first question, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? To know, love, and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. This is what the angels teach us. That's Absolutely. our purpose. Absolutely. To know, love, and serve the Lord. Yes. And their service of Christ, because the angels are Christocentric, their whole mission Wait, is really what do you around. Mean by Christocentric? They are centered on Jesus and his mission. Mm. And so we find them in the Annunciation, as you just mentioned, you know, in the announcement to the shepherds. And when you see their words, their message, and look more deeply at the scriptures, you can't help but delight at the plan of God mm -hmm. and the wonders revealed. You know, why did, why did uh, the angels bring their message to the shepherds? Well, there are some scholars who believe that the shepherds at Bethlehem were not simply ordinary shepherds who were tending lambs that could end up on someone's dinner table, but that they were Levitical shepherds who were Which actually means? preparing the lambs for the temple sacrifices. Uh -huh. And so the angels come to those shepherds who were rather marginalized by Jewish society because they were dealing with the animals and uh, a matter like that all day long. The angels come to these disenfranchised shepherds, the marginalized, to tell them, you who tend the lambs, the true lamb is born. They, and in, you will find him in a manger. You in, know. The, in the town called the House of Bread. Yes. You know, this is yes. Bethlehem. Yes. Yeah. And so there are marvelous details like this. When you, when you look at, for example, the two annunciations, the annunciation to Zechariah, to tell him of the birth of his son, John the Baptist, and the Annunciation to the Blessed Mother, you can see the different differences in response between Zechariah, the aged priest, and the Virgin of Nazareth. And in that, there are great lessons also, lessons about trust in God, obedience, mm -hmm. searching faith, fidelity, and so on. And all of these truths of the scriptures are underscored, if you will, emphasized by the presence of the angels and their participation in God's plan for us and our salvation. You know, when you think of the two annunciations to Zechariah and Our Lady, some people don't pay enough attention to the precise words used, and that's key, mm -hmm. because Zechariah gets in trouble. Yes. <laughs> he asked the angel, how am I to know this? Like you knowing it has anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's you're supposed to do what you're told. Right. And he wants to know, well, I want proof. I want to know it. So it's okay, I'll give you proof. You can't talk for the next nine months. And who knows what, how that relates to answering Elizabeth's prayers. I don't know. <laughs> but, but be that as it may, then when Our Lady speaks to him, she, her question is different. How is this to be? Mm -hmm. she, she's looking for the instruct. What do I do next? Yes. You know, since I know not man, how do I have a baby? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And that also teaches us how to respond to the angels. Precisely. You know, not yes. looking for proof. Mm -hmm. You see that what the call is, uh, uh, the angel at Samson's mother, mm -hmm. she does what he says. 
the dad, well, how am I supposed to know this? Right. Just like Zechariah. Right. And well, sometimes maybe it's a man woman thing. <laughs> well, we also have the Annunciation made to Saint Joseph. We have at least three instances when the angels speak to Joseph in his sleep. Mm -hmm. And the And oh, does what? What does he tell them there? Well, here again he tells Joseph that Joseph is to fulfill his mission from God. And it's quite extraordinary. There are many people who think that the appearance of the angel to Joseph is simply to reassure him about Mary's virtue. But the Catholic tradition, exemplified by the early fathers of the church, by hymns and litur liturgy, and by later theologians, is Joseph is being reassured about himself. That's something I talk about at great length in the book. And the key to that is that after t uh, telling Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary to your home as your wife, the angel tells him that he is to name the child Jesus, mm -hmm. which, of course, we know from Zechariah, is the Jewish tradition. It was the father's right to name the child. So Joseph is being given a mission, but also the authority to accomplish the mission. Mm -hmm. And that's quite extraordinary. So in other words, the angel is sent to Joseph to say, man up. Yep. You have been chosen by God the Father to be the protector and the model for this child. Matter of fact, when we, we see that Jesus teaches us to call God our Father, he addresses him as Abba, mm -hmm. but he learned that word in relationship to Joseph as yes. a baby. Joseph is the model for the human masculinity of Christ. That's his greatness. And it's a profound lesson. It's a profound lesson. Some people, uh, I think, overlook St. Joseph because we have no words attributed to him in the scripture. Right. He doesn't talk. He doesn't talk. But his, his silence is profound. It's a holy silence mm -hmm. that teaches us also that we have to empty ourselves in humility in order to receive what God wants to give us, yes. and then to respond. And Joseph certainly responds with all his heart. Yep. And, and you said that he spoke three times to Joseph. That was the first time. Yes. When else? There is the message to Joseph to arise and take the child and his mother to Egypt to save him from Herod, mm -hmm. and then to return from Egypt to Israel, because the, those who sought the child's life are now gone mm -hmm. on earth. So, Joseph's interaction with the angels, even though there are only those three messages, they tell us something very great about him. And that's why both Paul VI, blessed Paul VI, and St. John Paul II speak of Joseph in relationship to the angels in their encyclical letters and discourses on St. Joseph. It, it's also, you know, it's something in our own modern life to think how the angels come in with these messages and thoroughly disrupt St. Joseph's career plan. You know, uh, he, he didn't plan on going to Bethlehem and Egypt and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. This is an interruption mm -hmm. and a, a very serious change. And in response, he, as you said, mans up. Mm -hmm. He takes through responsibility and adapts to learn how to do his carpentry work in Egypt. Yes. God asks everything from him. And what did God give in return? He gave him his son. Mm -hmm. He gave him Christ to hold in his arms. He gave him the Immaculate Conception to be his companion and friend. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's amazing. That's a beautiful, beautiful gift. And it's also it's something that then applies to each of us in our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. Christ is given to each of us as Savior and as friend. Mm -hmm. He gives us his mother from the cross in order that she might be our spiritual mother and watch over us in everything and form Christ in us. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, the, in the other passages, because it's not just in the infancy of Jesus. Certainly not. That no. we see the angels taking a major role. The angels come into play throughout his ministry, mm -hmm. all the way through the ascension. Yes, yes, indeed. And at the ascension, uh, it's fascinating. We have the words of the angels telling the apostles, go back to Jerusalem, do what he told you, told you to do. 
but also the early fathers of the church say that the ascension was for the angels a time of great rejoicing and exultation because they saw God's plan reach yet a new phase of fulfillment as Jesus, God made man, ascends to the Father's right hand in his human body and his human nature. Mm -hmm. And that that caused the angels great joy, uh, which is a wonderful thing to think about. Yeah, this is a, a, a very important point. And they, they start to make that transition at that point of ha having given instruction to Zechariah, Our Lady, St. Joseph, ministering to Jesus in various ways. Yes. And now they start to give instructions to the church. Yes. You and know, the book of Acts is very precious yep. in that regard. Yep. St. Luke is in some ways the evangelist of the angels. Yeah, very you know, much so. From the very Annunciations so. all through the book of Acts. And there you see the the normalcy almost, we could say, of the presence of the angels cooperating with the apostles, encouraging them, sending them like Philip the deacon and Peter himself to those who were in need of their preaching and moving the church forward in its fidelity to Christ. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, quite remarkable. That's where the guardianship of the angels really is, is revealed in a Christian context. In the Old Testament, it's the book of Tobit, but mm -hmm. in the New Testament, it's in the book of Acts particularly. Mm -hmm. And throughout, our, you know, the angels are ministering to our Lord himself. Yes. Uh, in the, at, after the temptations in the wilderness. Yes. And also when he is uh, in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And then the angels are also present at the tomb, yes. at the resurrection. Yes. So there are all these different places. Mm -hmm. Now, in relationship to what you've done here, one of my thoughts was that since the angels were so key for human beings associated with Christ to know what they should do, and then they minister to Christ. I couldn't help but think of John 14, verse 6, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that if the angels surrounded him along his way, and if he is our way, I assume that you think that the angels are there to minister to us too. Yes, yes. But their, their primary role is to bring us to the fullness of divine life. So uh, when we think about the angels, it, we unfortunately tend to trivialize them. And we see the angels as finding us parking spaces and <laughs> uh, doing other things. Personally, I tell people to rely on St. Dismas the Good Thief for parking spaces, but that's for another television <laughs> show. Uh, the angel's role really is to guide us to Christ, to keep us faithful to Christ, to bring us to the fullness of maturity and joy in Christ. And they look at us with a certain wonder. We can't say envy because envy is a sin. Right. But there are things that we can do that the angels can't. Right. We can receive the Eucharist. We relate to Christ in his humanity, in his human nature. We receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. We talk about the Eucharist as the bread of angels and sing in our hymns in that way, but the angels can't receive communion. And there's another element too that you and I are particularly blessed with, that they cannot consecrate no. the Eucharist. No. This is a privilege that we've been given. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, and it's something that we have to uh, recognize. Recognize and, and recognize that this is something we have to treat as all the more precious. Yes. St. Francis of Assisi said if he met an angel and a priest walking down the road, he would first kiss the priest's hand and then he would greet the angel. I think that, that gives uh, yeah, us that cause say, for, yeah, that's <laughs> right. for, for us to make a good examination of conscience when we think of, of our vocation. Not to mention work on a good example. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And another, another element of our lives, which is a great mystery, is that of human suffering. We can suffer in union with Jesus on the cross. We can love him in the course of the difficulties of our lives. Both St. Therese, the little flower, 
in her uh, spiritual writings, and St. Faustina speak about learning this lesson, that this is something that the angels cannot do because they don't suffer bodily. Mm -hmm. But they see how our sufferings can be turned into good, how they can purify us from attachments to sin, how they can be an expiation not only for ourselves but for others, how they can unite us to Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is one of the greatest problems and mysteries for each of us to understand and to grapple with personally in our own life mm -hmm. and in our ongoing conversion. There's uh, one other element, too, that we can't afford to omit, and that is in the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord Jesus promised that every one of us has our own angel who is before the Father constantly. Yes. In other words, the guardian angels yes. are something that our Lord you know, promised us there. And I, I think I mentioned to you earlier today that there was a new age group that used to take people out to dance with dolphins in the ocean. And if the dolphin let you dance with them, then you got your own angel. And they only charged <laughs> a few hundred bucks for this. And I said, wait a minute. God gives us the guardian angels for free. Absolutely. And the dolphins have nothing to do with it. As much no. as I love the dolphins, they have nothing to do with the angels. No. Well, this is where it's very important for us to know what Revelation teaches about the angels. Because we have a tendency to use our own imagination and to decide what angels are like or how God deals with us through the angels. And instead, we have to go back to, the, to Scripture, to Revelation, to the tradition of the church, because that's where we find truth, purifying, yes. liberating truth and yes. clarity. Yes. Uh, and then we can appreciate the gifts God's given us and have the strength for the crosses that come to us in yes. daily life, yes. you know, and realize all things are possible in him who strengthens us. Yeah. And one of the ways he strengthens us is the presence of the guardian angel. Yes. So con cultivating that friendship can help us to pray, to forgive, to show mercy, and to persevere, to open our hearts to others. You know, m simply no remembering that everybody has a guardian angel. Even the people that I find most difficult and most annoying can help me to practice charity and to realize it's not all about the unholy trinity, I, me, and myself. It's about the most holy trinity. Even, w and I, I think a couple things, you know, in terms of a guardian angel, how many times do we have a, a feeling of a certain impulse to not commit a certain sin, to not go into an area that would be tempting, or something that might prevent us from a near occasion of sin. And I think that is a crucial area for the guardian angels. Absolutely. That they're trying to keep us away from sin yes. that would take away from the glory of God. And, uh, and sometimes from physical danger as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this is something to, for us to keep in mind. But also, you know, we live in a dangerous world. But even the most dangerous people in the world have guardian angels. Yes. You know, uh, the, the premier of North Korea has a guardian angel. It's not just the, the Catholics that have guardian angels. No, not at all. Every communist out there that's an atheist and all, they all have guardian angels. Yes. Can't so. we intercede and pray that their guardian angels l help draw them to greater good? Yes. That, they, that the guardian angels might speak to their charges, inspire them, have strength in, in uh, preventing further sin, as you say, but also bring them to an experience of goodness, to allow them to see things that their own sins have blinded them to. Right, right, and, and this is a very important element, you know, for us to, you know, in a, in a dangerous world. Yes. To pray that the guardian angels of the perpetrators of danger in crime would, we, that we help their guardian angels by interceding. And the angels in that regard also lead us to clarity 
about right and wrong. Yes. The angels are not simply sentimental creatures, you no. know, uh, cupids with, no. with pink wings. Uh, that's not the Christian tradition no. of representation of angels. The only person in scripture who sees an angel and is immediately unafraid is our Blessed Lady, the Immaculate Conception. Right. Everyone else is struck with fear because they are the bearers of the majesty of God. The angels are. The angels are. Yeah. And yet they accommodate themselves to us because their mission is to assist us on the pathway of salvation. All right, we have to take a little break, but I want to let you know you can get Father Horgan's newest book, which is called His Angels at Our Side, Understanding Their Power in Our Souls and the World. Also, you can save it, uh, save 40% on it, when you buy it together with his DVD series, Angels of God. Now, both of them are available at EWTN's Religious Catalog, uh, the set, the book and the DVD set, is item 8035, so 80305 k uh, Just go to EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316 and learn more about the angels and, more importantly, learn how to integrate them into our prayer. That's more important. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Get your questions, questions from our studio audience. So please stay with us. Welcome back, and we are ready for some questions, comments, and your responses. Great. So uh, let's start off with Mary Ann. Mary Ann, where are you calling from? I'm calling from New York City. How are you, Father Pacwa? Fine. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome back. And what is oh, your question? You. Uh, my question is, I know in the beginning of the show you were talking about um, uh, you know, the, 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 the great uh, momentous occasions when angels... You know, in the life of our Blessed Lady and St. Joseph and the shepherds. Um, but I was just curious with, um, with us as mere mortals and angels in our everyday lives, how do we tap into um, integrating them into our lives, just getting through like, just the daily trials and tribulations, um, and you're, you're just getting through life, and how do we know or how do we spot how they are integral in our lives? Okay, great. God bless. Thanks. Excellent so, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing is to be conscious of the angels, to be aware of them, and to ask for their friendship mm -hmm. so that you are accepting God's plan and providence for you in giving you a guardian angel. And ask that angel to help you with your prayer, with your service of your neighbor, to accompany you to Mass, to accompany you to communion. You know, ask to help the you get up out of clarity. bed to go to Mass. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if that is all you do during the day, if you are otherwise at home doing your chores and, and, and uh, living a very quiet life because of your age, your health, you've participated in something infinite, mm -hmm. of infinite value. That's something that we need to remember and encourage so that we have more Catholics participating in daily Mass. Yep. But the angel we, in, we should invoke to help us to make our judgments to choose always to do the will of God, to be faithful to Him in little things, to show us what's going on around us so that we see things that we wouldn't see ordinarily. It's easy for us to overlook the needs of others, their cries for help, their silent appeals. The angels can help us with this in a remarkable way. 
They make us sensitive because the noise of the world and the sins of the world and our own sins desensitize us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to Christ and to the presence of the angels, I uh, think supernatural that's, friends. That's a very good point about the way that they sensitize us. Mm -hmm. If you're alert to angelic presence, then you may be more alert to the pools by the forces of evil and the bad spirits. Yes, yes. As well as alert to the attractions of the good of spirit. The good. And it's important to know how to discern those. Uh, I, I was talking to, uh, or dealing with an email recently where a, a man felt peace about his call to marriage but then after making that decision, he felt this uh, fear and anxiety. Maybe I should have been a priest. And he, he went into this anxiety. That anxiety would be the work of the bad angels. Of course, yes. After he had already made a, a, a decision in peace, right. that he felt discerned from God. Yes. And the evil spirits would try to make us unhappy, mm -hmm. while the Holy Spirit and the angels will work to bring us peace and order. And that, that gift of peace and order may involve a great deal of work on our part to restore to us our interior structure of virtues. You know, there are so many people today who uh, have developed addictions of various kinds, mm -hmm. dependencies, mm -hmm. and some of these dependencies are extremely destructive. So the angels can help us to reclaim a life of virtue by showing us what temperance involves, that interior restraint and moderation of physical pleasures in view of the higher things of God. And that's going to involve, yes, <coughs> renunciation, mm -hmm. but it also involves humility and memory and gratitude and longing for what really, la it really matters. And the angels direct us to those things, not through extraordinary visions and revelations, as are reported by some of the saints. You know, we have, we have evidence of the angels in the lives of many of the saints, but they didn't all have visions. Right. They lived in an intimacy, a friendship with their angels, and their inspirations helped them to be faithful to God, to be loving towards their neighbor, and to contemplate the cross and to see in the cross the means of our salvation, the mm -hmm. proof of Christ's love, and the means by which all of us, each of us, ordinarily, day after day, advance closer and closer to Christ and work out our salvation yeah. in loving service. I have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Aransas Pass, Texas. Good to have you here. Welcome. Thank and you. your question? Uh, my wife Rachel and I have both had instances together and separately that we attribute to angels in human form. Uh, one that she had specifically in the hospital had to be supernatural because she asked where that wonderful nurse came from. The doctor said, the nurses said, we never had a nurse like that. Um, how do we recognize when an angel is about us and how do we tune into them so we can understand and hear, recognize wh where they are and who they are? Very good. Wonderful. Thank you for your question. Well, this now, sort of reminds me of the line in the letter to the Hebrews, some people have unwittingly entertained angels. Yes. And unwittingly is a key word there because we're not always supposed to recognize them at the time mm -hmm. because that can be a distraction in our spiritual life. So we accept the service that they offer, the blessings that they bring, the word of advice, or the protection in a time of danger. And then it's only afterwards that the Lord brings it into our mind and heart to recognize this came from the Lord through the ministry of an angel, through the presence of an angel. And we may not know with absolute certainty in this life that every instance of protection or extraordinary help was actually angelic, but we will in the next. In the, here on earth, our call is to accept with gratitude and humility and press on in doing the good. On one occasion, when I was a hospital chaplain, uh, I relate this story at great length in the book. I was at the bedside of a dying man who had resisted baptism for quite a long time. 
And it was his good wife whose prayers were constantly calling down God's mercy on him. So on this one morning, quite by, by chance, and of course there are no chances in God, I happened to visit him and I said, will you be baptized? And he answered yes, and he said some things about his life that made me realize, of course, that he had come to a, a real conversion. Yeah. yeah. And so I turned to get out my, my ritual and stole and so on, and I heard very clearly in my mind the word now. So I had uh, some sterile water in a medicine cup, and I immediately turned without doing anything else in the ritual and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He was dead before I said the word amen. Hmm. He died in that very moment. And that to me was a very powerful sign. Absolutely. I, I had been certainly not only in the presence of the Lord through his sacrament, but his ministering angel who moved my hand and spoke that word. Yep. And it wasn't through any merit of mine. It was the prayers of that good man's wife, or his, uh, that, uh, that good wife, who all through the years had prayed for that moment and had endured great sufferings and crosses in order to bring her ex-husband to that moment of grace and conversion. Yeah. And, I, I, and there are lots and lots of stories like that. One of my priest friends from Nashville, Tennessee, Monsignor George Rowling, was reading the study on the night he just felt, I gotta go to the hospital. Sure enough, he went, a, a woman gave birth to a stillborn child. She was dying so he could give her the last rites. But before he did that, he went over, baptized the baby, anointed her. I know that baby. Uh -huh. He's still alive. He came back to life. How wonderful. It's amazing. And the angel, you know, he didn't, nobody called him. No. There was no, it's one of those things where the, the angels, I think the Lord doesn't just send them out to Zechariah and Our Lady. Mm -hmm. That's everyday and, and an of evidence stuff. of that too is how many of our non-Catholic friends report the ministry of the angels. You know, uh, some, some extraordinary thing that has happened in their life or in the life of someone in their family that they are convinced is a, a spiritual intervention on the part of God. Yep. And Absolutely. even if they're not religious or churchgoers themselves, they hold on to that. Yep. They treasure Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, it it's, it's just shows the, the universality of God's plan of love in sending the angels to us. Uh, and that's extraordinary. It is. Let's go to another call. I have Jeannie on. Jeannie, where are you from? Hello? Jean? Hi. Um, Hi, where are you I from? Did. I'm from Louisiana. Oh, great. Welcome. And your question? I want to explain why we shouldn't uh, name our angels. Okay. Good question. Okay. Why don't we name our guardian angels? Because our guardian angels are not pets. We don't have authority over our guardian angels. That's the first thing. God and, and names what the you angels. What you said before about St. Joseph was told to name Jesus, right? showing his authority. Yes. We don't have authority over the angels. We do not. We do not. The name of the angel is also something that in, in Hebrew tradition is connected with the very essence of their being, that yes. God calls them forth into existence. Yep. So we will know names in heaven, but not here on earth. The church is actually very careful about this. Yep. The church allows us in our liturgical prayer and private prayer to use only the three names that are revealed clearly in Scripture for three individual archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. We do not invoke the other archangels, and traditionally there is the belief that there are seven archangels, but we do not use the other names in liturgy or in prayer, nor do we ascribe names to other angels, even when we have uh, such recorded in the lives or legends of saints. Mm -hmm. They're not used liturgically. And there's a, a deeper, a deep meaning to this. Not only is it a matter of the authority of God, but also God has a message for us through the angel. If we choose a name, we risk masking the mission of the angel. 
you know? I might think that the greatest saint is your own Jesuit brother, Francis Xavier. Right. So I'm going to call my angel Xavier. But if I'm called to be a contemplative, if I'm called to be a Carthusian, if I'm a man or a Carmelite right. nun, right. I may be putting up a block for the angel to help me to understand and discern my contemplative vocation because I'm projecting a missionary life. So we can, be, we can actually uh, harm the delicacy of God's ways and, and mission to us. Right. And the church has officially asked in the directory on popular piety That's right. That's that right. we not name our angels. Exactly. So if you've done it, you haven't committed a sin, but it's better to, con to call your angel by the title brother, holy angel, teacher, my friend given me by God, so that we can retain and grow that humility before the Lord, mm -hmm. which is still part of our relationship with the angels. Mm -hmm. We're called to intimate friendship with them as we are with Jesus, uh, but we still have to respect, above all things, the majesty of Christ, Lord and eternal Son of the Father, and the holiness and power of the triune God reflected in the angel. Yep. All right. We have another question. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wonderful. And, and your question? My, yes. I was school my my um, in Italy with my sisters, the nuns, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and during the class, there was a mention and discussed by angel. We got two angels on our on our back. Uh -huh. He's a good angel, he's a bad angel. Yes. In the meantime, they said, you always got to listen to the good one, not the bad one. You know, you can make the road that way, or you can make the road the other way. Right. So, I want to know if there is such a thing. Okay. Or, if something may be misinterpreted. Okay, so... Do we have a good angel trying to influence us on one side and a bad angel to lead us to be bad? Well, the church has never made a declaration that we have a guardian devil or an antagonist devil for each one of us. So it's not a doctrine. So it's not a doctrine. It has been a common way of explaining to children and to adults uh, the, the tension that can exist and the confusion that can exist within our minds, within our consciences, mm -hmm. about doing good or evil. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, we listen. We should always listen to the good angel, but we should also remember there are an awful lot of sins and temptations that we don't need the demon to instigate. We can get ourselves <laughs> I, into quite a bit of trouble absolutely. on our own. I do plenty of my own temptations. They're all homemade. Right. I right. We do that. not have to source them out. Yes. You know? <laughs> so uh, while the devil is responsible for a great deal of temptation, he's interested in tempting us, in striking out at the image and likeness of God, the Holy Trinity that is within us. That's, you know? that's exactly what the evil spirit wants to do. And to make us despair yep. of our human nature, of God's love and of his mercy. You know, if you look at the temptations of Christ in the desert, you can see in those three temptations, the three titles that are given to the devil in scripture. He is called a murderer, mm -hmm. a liar, and an accuser. And in the temptations, as murderer, he strikes out at God the Father, the source of life. As liar, against the Son, the word of truth and as accuser against the Holy Spirit and his mercy. Yeah, because you know? paraclete, the Holy Spirit, means your counselor as a defense lawyer. The word diabolos in Greek means the prosecuting attorney mm -hmm. who accuses you of sin. And the book of Revelation makes mention of that in chapter 12 of Revelation, that the devil is the one who is accusing us. Right. And so uh, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, 
but the devil accuses us. So when you see, sometimes people feel, well, I still, f I, I went to confession, but I still feel guilty, and I still feel like I haven't really gotten forgiven. That's a temptation mm -hmm. from the other side. Absolutely, absolutely. I have another caller. Hello. Is the caller there? Hello, this is Chris. Chris, okay, I didn't have a name for you. Where are you from, Chris? I am from Dubuque, Iowa. Well, you're something. And so what is your question, sir? I was wondering if Father could tell me about Jacob wrestling with an angel of the Lord all night long. Yeah. Why would he do this? And who won the wrestling match? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is actually an excellent question. Well, first of all, don't try wrestling with an angel. You're going no. to come out on the short end of the stick. And Jacob not to mention a broken hip. That's right. Jacob limped for the rest of his life. But that imagery is, is thought by many scripture scholars, and you're the man who's the expert here, to be an image of, J of Jacob wrestling with the will of God as expressed by the angel, mm -hmm. and therefore with his own obedience to the Lord. There's another part of it. Um, and Chris, I want you to take a look a little bit earlier when Jacob was running away from his brother, mm -hmm. he went to Bethel, fell asleep, and he saw the original stairway to heaven and with the angels going up and down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. After he has that, he anoints the stone where he was sleeping, and he says, Lord, if you get me food and clothing, and you bring me back to this country, this country safely, then I'll let you be my God. You don't bargain with God with impunity. And so when he did come back with uh, uh, two wives, two concubines, and uh, 13 kids, and flocks of sheep, the Lord said, now, you got to find out who's boss. And so he wrestles him, and then, uh, and then he changes his name to Yisrael. Sarah is the word that means wrestle. So El means God. So he becomes, he wrestles with God. And so, and God wrestles right back. Yes, indeed. Let's take one more quick phone call. Hello, Vincent. Yes, good evening, Father. Hi, where are you from? Uh, New Jersey. Great. Any okay, questions? I to, uh, yeah, I have a quick question for the, uh, uh, the angels. If they have personalities, do they just repeat what the Lord is telling them, or do they uh, do it on their uh, not on their own, but uh, with the will of God? But do they express it in their own personality, or like we do with people? Uh, do they express themselves? Interesting question. Interesting question. The angels are persons. They're angelic persons. And so they do have that individuality that we commonly express by the word personality. But our personality is the result of the endowment that God has given us and our own experiences. So each angel has a place in the hierarchy, the order of creation. Mm -hmm. Some of them understand things immediately, the higher choirs, and others receive their information and understanding of God in part through those that are higher than them. So yes, in terms of how an angel speaks to us, there would be a differentness, a differentness between Gabriel and Michael or Raphael. Mm -hmm. Each of them has their way of seeing God, just as we look at God perhaps in terms of one transcendental aspect more than another. Mm -hmm. Some contemplate the God of truth, others beauty, others God's almighty power, and that's the bridge by which we begin to approach the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the angels have something similar, right. and that would be manifest in their mission. Yeah, and St. Thomas Aquinas mentions that each one is his own nature. Yes. There's, a, there's no yes. one nature, but they all have a unique. But also, part of this nature is that we're out of time. Really, already. So why don't you Marvelous. join me in giving a blessing over here, Certainly. okay? May the Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And again, we can bring Father Horgan here, and as well as have his old series, 
and all the other guests and programs we have here only because this network is brought to you by you. Mother Angelica felt inspired to have it that way instead of with commercials. And so we do need you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill because we get lots of bills and that goes on all summer long. God bless you and thank you for your support.